गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटमैन माय नेम इज़ राहुल गोखले आई एम करेंटली सेकेंड ईयर एम बी इट इज़ माय ऑनर टू इंट्रोड्यूस आर नेक्स्ट पैनल ऑफ द डे ऑन वैल्यू फोकस्ड इनोवेशन ऑन द फ्रंट लाइन्स वी आर प्रिविलेज टू हैव थ्री वेरी डिस्टिंगविस्ट guests with us here today dr richard foster is a venture partner with lux capital managing partner of the millbrook management group and chairman of ansera diagnostics along with being a member on the board of multiple companies dr foster is also an emeritus senior partner at mckinsey where he founded and led several practices including the private equity healthcare technology and innovation practice and also mckinsey's worldwide knowledge development dr gaurav dayal is president of new markets and chief growth officer at chenmed dr dayal has wide ranging experience in population health health plans and pharmacy benefit manager operations previously dr dayal was a senior vice president at lumeris a healthcare technology company in st louis and has served as president interim ceo and senior vice president within the ssm healthcare system dr dayal is also a washu alum and has finished his residency in pediatrics at washu dr luis chang is babylon health's director of clinical ai where she leads the clinical strategy and development of babylon's portfolio of digital first products in north and south america she is an internal medicine physician who also serves as an adjunct assistant professor at emory university school of medicine previously dr chang held leadership positions at web md the american cancer society and multiple startups last but not the least i would like to introduce the panel's rock star moderator dr thomas maddox <laughs> Dr Maddox is the executive director of the Healthcare Innovation Lab here at BJC Healthcare and Washu. He is also a practicing cardiologist and a professor of medicine at the Washu School of Medicine. Previously Dr Maddox served as the national director for Veterans Affairs CART Cardiac Quality Program. He is widely published and holds national leadership positions in the American Co College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. so uh, i welcome you all and turn the mic over to dr maddox thank you thank you <clears throat> well thank thanks everyone and um thank you for the uh for the olin uh, business school for putting this together and giving me the opportunity to do what i love to do and that is pepper people with questions <laughs> i was very excited to learn about the three panelists we have here today um in in my one of my roles as a innovation leader Uh I think a lot about what does innovation mean and a definition we often use is implementation of a new idea that creates value. And one thing that I think uh all three panelists share is a common theme is they've been thinking deeply about how to do that in a very specific part of the innovation ecosystem. You know, we heard this morning from Alex about how J&J is moving in the space and they're obviously focused a lot in bio pharma innovation med tech innovation but care delivery innovation is a relative newcomer to the field and i think all three panelists have some good experience in that so what i'd like to do is first you know we heard the initial introductions but i'd i'd love to hear from each of you a little bit more about what you and your organizations particularly around care delivery innovation are doing and then we'll start to unpack a little bit about how they're approaching it and some of the the some of the barriers or thoughts that they have about about implementing that innovation. So maybe we'll start with you. Sure. So um I'm the director of clinical AI in North and South America with Babylon Health and Babylon exists to put in the hands of every person on earth uh accessible and affordable healthcare service. Um and we do that by combining three things: smartphone technology, uh machine learning and clinical expertise. And so um you know as the the speakers that um went before us uh commented on as far as value based care and innovation um really taking a step back and looking at um how we deliver care uh and and being creative about using uh machine learning and AI to help inform care delivery. So it in the NHS where um Babylon is a uh, originated in the UK um they've been recognized for their successes in delivering care um through this digital first care service um and most recently um partnered with uh, the city of Wolverhampton for a 10 year integrated health system 
uh, strategy uh, to help cover a population of over 300,000 people. So uh, a lot of innovation there, and I don't want to monopolize my time right now, but we can go into it a little bit later. Um, thank you, Tom. I'm Gaurav Dale. I'm with a company called Chen Med. Um, first of all, I want to thank Washu and Olin for um, asking me to speak here. I'm, I'm honored as an alumni. I'm also I'm honored to be sitting next to Dick Foster, just on a personal note. Um, 20 years ago, I was a first year associate at McKinsey and Company, um, and Dick is a legend there. Um, and I read uh, one of the required readings was a book that he wrote, I think, around the same year on creative destruction. So um, I feel like, you know, I'm at my uh, alma mater, sitting next to my former company's leaders, I feel great. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, to the question and point, um, ChenMed is basically, uh, you know, is, an, is, an, is one of the nation's leading primary care group that focuses on under um, uh, underserved seniors who are on Medicare Advantage. Uh, we, um, our business model is very simple. I like to describe it as a seesaw. Exceptional customer service. Um, we look at that very um, scientifically, not how we feel, um, but from using a metric called Net Promoter Score. Um, for uh, folks in the business, Net Promoter Scores in most healthcare companies, insurance plans run in the single digits. Our goal is to be in the 80 to 90 percent range. Um, at the same time, amazing clinical service as well. Um, what we offer to seniors on Medicare Advantage is a very hands-on concierge clinical model where your doctor is available to you 24-7 by phone. We provide transportation to pick you up to, your, uh, to our clinics. Our clinics have on-site pharmacy, on-site radiology, and on-site specialty services. Um, through, you know, it's, it's, this is a family-owned business. We've been around for about 30 years, but I think we're sort of one of those overnight successes, 30 years in the making. Um, as of this summer, uh, we will be in St. Louis. I'm really proud to announce that. Um, we're gonna be opening three locations in St. Louis, um, which is one of 20 locations we're opening this summer. And at the end, by this summer, we'll be in 10 states, 19 cities, um, and 82 or 83 locations, but who's counting? Um, the company's tripled in size over the past three years. I'm really proud to be part of that growth. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about how we view innovation and care delivery, which is somewhat paradoxical that we view care delivery innovation to be unique in healthcare, right? Because healthcare is care delivery, um, but uh, it tends to not get the attention I think it deserves. So I'm uh, looking forward to talking about that. So number one, uh, I'm very honored to be part of this panel. And uh, I, I had no idea about all the background we shared until I'm, I'm listening to it with fascination <laughs> myself. So. That's, that's absolutely great. We can just uh, circle up here and turn our back yeah, to that. Uh, just really get, get I'll, into I'll pull, it. Yeah. I'll pull around here. <laughs> the, uh, so uh, the reason I went to McKinsey in the first place was because I couldn't decide what I want to do, and I'm still in that position uh, now, X years uh, later. So I do a lot of different things in healthcare, and I have different responses to this answer depending on which the enterprise is. So I'm, I'm chairman of a company called ZocDoc, um, and you may have heard of ZocDoc, uh, but we do patient appointments. Well, that's a totally different business uh, now than, than uh, delivering care, but is it part of care delivery? It, it is. Uh, we do a million appointments uh, a month at, uh, at this point. So uh, is that an opportunity? Is that a platform for delivering care in a more efficient way going forward? It, it, it is, and stay tuned. Uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll see some of those, those things happening. Um, I'm also on the board, not, not the chairman of, of a company, with the unforgettable name of Lean Toss. You, I'm sure that creates an image for you immediately. Uh, it took me about three years to figure out what that meant. <laughs> but Lean, Lean Toss is a bunch of ex-McKinsey mathematicians who have figured out, uh, in the first case, how to optimize uh, uh, the scheduling of infusion chairs. Infusion chairs are very, very complex. Uh, because uh, the chair sessions are 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours, four hours, and there's one of about 70 different cocktails you can get, some of which have to be prepared a month in advance, some of which have to be prepared two hours uh, in, in advance. So you have this amazing optimization schedule, so if we have 500 chairs, which we, we do, and you're trying to optimize this so you're not losing money hand over fist, uh, you can count on the fact that when you've got this ideal schedule for Monday morning, on Monday morning at 8.30, the first guy in will say, I'd really like to make it, but I'm stuck in the Lincoln Tunnel. I'll be there in two hours, right? <laughs> and now, now you start all over again. So they have figured out how to optimize that, uh, that, those mathematics. And now we're doing about half the chairs in the NCCN uh, cancer centers. So that's, that's a lot. That's, that's also care delivery in, in a way, but it's, it's a little different uh, angle than, uh, uh, than we normally uh, think of. And then uh, I'm on the board of an OBGYN uh, roll-up. Um, 
And that's really interesting because we're bringing what you would think would be common business sense management to uh, OBGYNs, but OBGYNs are not trained to manage businesses, as it turns out. <laughs> and it's very complex managing an OBGYN uh, practice. So we've been uh, doing that and we're rolling up around the country. We have uh, about uh, 200 practitioners now and uh, I don't know how many uh, patients, but a lot. The uh, uh, OBGYN, uh, not, uh, and I will eventually stop, uh, hopefully fairly soon. Um, OBGYN is interesting because uh, everybody is under the age of 40. Uh, and that's different from being over the age of 60. So mom comes in and she really knows how to use this phone, right? And, and so does the, the little tribe that she's already produced that's following around. They all know how to use these phones. They don't think it's odd at all. On the other hand, the uh, 80 plus crowd, uh, uh, sometimes they, they get the idea, but it's not second nature to them. So, so in OBGYN, we have uh, an experimental uh, field where we can watch the future of medicine unfold in, in, in some ways. So I think that's, so all these three are totally, totally different. So I don't think we're gonna have a universal uh, solution. That's right. I'm finally finished. <laughs> oh, I hope not. I hope not. All right. My, my job is to make sure you're not done. <laughs> so, um, so let's, let's unpack a little bit around the idea of implementation. So each of you have needed to, over the years, think about implementation, the environment in which you're working and the unique value proposition you provide. And maybe, Louise, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, I know you're relatively new to Babylon, but they obviously grew up in the UK. Mm -hmm. They also have a big footprint in Rwanda, which I think is really interesting. And now you're starting to move into markets, and I think, I'm not sure if it's the wisest move, but you're about to enter the crazy US healthcare market. And what do you think you guys are learning about, and what implications will there be from an implementation point of view about the digital solution that Babylon provides in the US healthcare system? Right, so their track record has been extremely positive and if you look at the work they've done in the UK and the recognition that they've had um, they're the third largest GP practice in the NHS system um, huh. and their their star ratings and, and all that um, you know remember that in the NHS primary care is sort of the heart right the heart of their healthcare system and so you know although the systems are different in the UK as they are in the US you know having that as sort of the foundation of from which it grew um, is, is pretty key and there are a lot of good learnings from that um, in the UK they have the digital first they have the telehealth they also have freestanding clinics so they have tremendous data they've collected over the past um, several years um, with the care model that they've been delivering and really have been able to like learn from that and take those learnings as they come into the US. Now the market's gonna be definitely um, much more complicated, um, but we're starting from a good place and we're finding wonderful partners to listen to the market, listen to clients, uh, listen to patients and listen to providers um, and, and really incorporating all those inputs. So that's one component. The other component is um, related to um, you know, what we might call localization and just making sure that we are making, um, delivering and making our products in such a way that they are relevant to our targeted populations that we're serving um, and that they're relevant to the providers or the um, clinicians in the, in the populations that we're serving. Uh, and so that includes, you know, not just uh, the, the clinical information, right, the epidemiology and that type of thing, but it includes such things as language, uh, user experience, um, the patient experience, understanding um, the, the U.S. patient point of view um, across the country. Right. I guess one follow-up there I wonder about that you've seen both in the UK and then coming to the US is a little bit about what Dick said, and that is the, the comfort, the sort of familiarity that different age groups have with digital technology. And what have you guys learned, at least so far, <clears throat> about that your first experience with healthcare would be with a bot as opposed to a person? I think about my father, who I remember first got ex exposed to Uber and then tried to call them to reserve his car, <laughs> right? And um, he just needed to learn that in a different way. So are you finding that the way to introduce and get people comfortable with the, the Babylon interface 
needs to be tailored in part to age and digital experience, if you will? Right, so we're, we're, we're actively doing research in that. Um, what mm. they've learned in the UK um, is that, well, first of all, Babylon offers its services to anyone and everyone um, in the UK. Uh, I would say that most of their um, users, uh, tend, active users, tend to be in sort of the, the 20 to 35 sort of age range, mm. as you know, Dick was mentioning, um, the younger, kind of more younger population. It's not to say that uh, others aren't using it, um, but thinking about how we engage, how we introduce them. You know, sometimes, you know, we're, in general, we're seeing an uptick, I think, overall with the use of telehealth services. Um, you know, one thing is access, the other thing is convenience um, that we touched upon in, a, in a, the previous discussion. So, um, you know, I, I think we're actively looking at that, um, and at the same time, um, really incorporating the, the learnings. Um, you know, another avenue is thinking about who in the family, if you're talking about elderly, uh, elderly, more elderly uh, patients, is sort of the care manager of the family mm. and, and thinking about caregivers as well. Got it, All right. Gareth, t tell us a little bit about the decades now experience mm -hmm. Chen Met has had. Um, and in particular, the idea of really focusing on and optimizing the experience yeah. to accompany the outcomes that we're trying to deliver in healthcare is, as you said, and perhaps a little sadly, kind of new. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the whole idea of the healthcare industry is thinking themselves as, as customer delivery in addition to healthcare and health delivery. And it's an important piece of that. How have you guys thought about that and, and where do you see, how do you see that done well? Yeah, um, so you know, just to connect the dots with the last uh, panel, um, and for those of you in the audience who may not understand the, what Medicare Advantage is, because I personally didn't a few years ago, um, Medicare Advantage is basically a capitated Medicare program. Um, so in terms of value-based care, it's actually probably the largest value-based program that exists in the country because Medicare itself is the largest payer in this country, and about 40% of members within Medicare are Medicare Advantage members. The way Medicare Advantage works is federal government basically has subcontracted out to private industry, private insurance companies, Medicare contracts, and then companies such as ChenMed contract with the insurer and work on a full capitated risk model. Um, so from a business perspective, we are fully at risk. And for those more sort of on the, on the delivery side, that means part A, part B, part D, stop loss. So basically we get a check, we have to manage against it. Um, not just from a total cost of care metric, but also from a outcomes as well as customer satisfaction metric. Um, around engagement, um, and I'll apologize up front, I tend to speak very directly, but um, I'm a physician. Um, I don't think when I was training a, as a resident that engaging with patients was even part of any discussion. It was like, hey, they have pneumonia, they have whatever, or they have, you know, they're about to have a baby. Um, treat them and treat them, right? Um, and that's sort of the mentality that the US healthcare system, that's a that's not a, something I came up with, that's a very commonly used phrase. Um, uh, at, at the same time, in the past, there was this very high, and I was talking to somebody last night at dinner for this uh, uh, meeting, um, that you know people had primary care physicians, um, or they had pediatricians where you know they knew end to end what was going on. So there was what we very nicely now call a care coordinator that actually used to be your doctor, um, <laughs> and it's a novel concept now. And I think over time, because of either consolidation or, ex or an excessive movement towards. Uh, the business becoming a sick business rather than health business where you know money is made when people get sick rather than not when they're kept healthy there's really been a defragmentation of that model of care between physician we can call it provider uh, these days and patient um, so in essence what we have done is to basically go back in time and say that the person who manages your care needs to know who you are that doesn't happen when you're running as a primary care physician a panel size of 28, 2,600 patients. That's a transactional business and perhaps there's a need for that. Um, and frankly, I may fit in the category of folks who yeah. like that transactional business because I don't have a PCP. Um, but that isn't going to help an 80-year-old who doesn't know how to use Uber, who has five chronic care conditions, and who is like my mom, um, gets lost in the system, right? Um, even when your son's a doctor, it's very challenging right. to actually coordinate care. 
Um, so what we're attempting to do, or what we are doing, is to really bring that back. Um, it's somewhat sad that it's a unique model, uh, frankly, um, because that is mm -hmm. the kind of care I think we should all aspire towards for ourselves, and definitely for the elderly population. Um, what is very critical in this model is the ability to engage with patients. Um, you need time, you need technology, um, and you need incentives, right? Um, I think physicians, caregivers go into medicine, go in to, to help people, um, but something happens between med school, residency, fellowship training, whatever, where that sort of gets sucked out of you. Um, and it's not because we're bad people. I think we're all very well-intentioned people, but the business is, it's a business. Um, so how do you make the business about engagement? If you can make the business about engagement, and if you actually care about your patient, clinical outcomes do follow. The other way doesn't work. Um, so one thing we focus very highly on is the customer side of the business. Um, so for example, one of our uh, board members is the co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton. Um, his name is, he literally founded it, his name's Horst Schultz. Um, and we use Horst's, um, Horst is very, in, Horst has more influence mm -hmm. on care delivery at Chen Med than any doctor does. The doctors know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. CHF, hypertension, diabetes, depression. These are all very manageable conditions, and we're not looking for a breakthrough to come from, you know, WashU to manage that. We, we know how to do that. What we don't typically know how to do in healthcare is how to actually deliver solutions that work, and that's where having customer engagement where patients call you first, call the doctor first, call the nurse first, if they're having a CHF exacerbation, rather than going to Barnes Hospital and getting admitted, and apart from spending probably $20,000 while they're there, probably get a hospital-acquired infection and further complications. So a lot of stress on how, and a lot of stress on how to find people who can engage uh, with, uh, with patients at a, at a, at a much more non-transactional level, um, how to train them. We use the word deprogramming, that fee-for-service has really broken this doctors. How do you deprogram them? And frankly, for the primary care docs in the room, primary care has been pushed down. Like, primary care is like, Loss leaders, you know, we lose money on every primary care doc. How do you actually bring that pride and practice back so that primary care doctors actually are pivotal in managing total cost of care and frankly running the business? Um, it's not easy, but that's something we, uh, ha if there's anything that we've innovated, I think, is standardization and constant evolution of those standards along that spectrum of selection, training, and delivery. So that, <coughs> fascinating and really well, Described. It makes me wonder about a concept you touched on, this an anticipatory care. Yeah. That somebody's reaching out, ideally before they're really sick, Correct. maybe go to the ED or the hospital. And I think certainly in my world, what I've heard is people are viewing technology as a little bit of a savior for us. And that, oh, if we just get the right sensors in the home and the right technology and the right data, we can get ahead of these conditions and really yeah. improve outcomes. Well, what I think I heard you say is that a big driver of that for you guys is relational. Correct. And that that human relationship in many ways potentiates that anticipatory care. Absolutely. So if you posit, and maybe this is the yeah. wrong hypothesis, that it may be a combination of the technology and the relationship, how would you weight those in an ideal sense? You know, it's interesting. Um, I've probably been on, I've been on a panel about this topic specifically, and actually with somebody like a huh. Babylon Health, which is, you know, I have a lot of respect for what Babylon's doing, but it's very different than what we're doing. Yeah. Um, it's very high tech. We are very high touch. Um, hmm. Our high tech is all on the back. back. Like for example, analytics, predictive analytics. Um, we've built our own EMR. We have our own tool that says, here's your top 40 spenders and top 40 likely patients to go to the hospital. But the patient does not see any of this. The patient, our average patient is 76 years old. They don't want to, they are, they, they're, they're not too thrilled about telehealth. We do not specifically offer a telehealth option, which is, I think, controversial. Mm. Um, it's not because we're Luddites, but here's our perception. We try to see our patients once a month on average. If they're sick, we want to see them once a week till they get better. I know those numbers sound crazy, but the average doc, and then the average panel in our company is running around 350 docs, 350 patients per physicians. Wow. For the non-physicians out there, I'm not missing a zero. It is about an eighth of the size of the average panel of the US uh, primary care doc. Those docs, however, have to know in and out how to manage these patients and everything about them. But the patients have to come in to see the doc. It's, and I think that's where the engagement comes in. It's very, 
Nobody likes going to see the doctor, right? It's, a, it's not a pleasant experience, and it's all usually because you're sick. And nobody wants to see a doctor when they're feeling healthy, and especially once a month. Um, so what we spend a lot of time is building that sort of pull where patients do come in and can get managed. The reason we don't use, at the moment, telehealth is a lot of things happen in a personal visit with a 76-year-old who has five chronic conditions. They may have come in for a sore throat, but it could be that they had hypertension that's not managed well, or they're depressed, or their CHF is about to get tipped over. Um, we really view that, even if it's a 15-minute face-to-face encounter, to be very critical. Wow. And at the moment, and again, um, uh, this goes back to this whole creative destruction theory, we've had these conversations that maybe the next iteration of ChenMet is Babylon, and we as the innovators are already getting disrupted because we're very wed to this whole concept of face-to-face interactions, which may may be supplanted in the next decade. Because I was just about to say, when you're doing a telehealth consultation, you have insight into the home or wherever they are. um, Correct. The the environment and and what's happening. And sometimes people feel uh, more comfortable uh, in in that setting, in their safe place. I agree. I think we have an assumption, it's not Mm -hmm. a proven one, that Mm -hmm. our patients don't fit that. Our average patient still wants to see Dr. Maddox and have Dr. Maddox talk to them and check their pulse and put the stethoscope on their, on their chest and listen. Um, but it is something that I think we're gonna have to evolve in our thinking, especially as the current 55 year olds become Medicare Advantage beneficiaries a decade from now who are going to be yeah. used to more like uh, telehealth solutions. Yeah, that was my, you know, right now the birth decade of your patients yeah. is in the 1940s. Correct. What is it when it's in the 1970s and in the yep. 2000s? Yep. And how does that yeah. shift? Yeah. And, and just to clarify, um, with our clinical services um, with Babylon, um, it's you know during that assessment, if someone needs to be seen in person, of right. course, then you know it's not an either or kind of thing. Yeah. No, Correct. Uh, fascinating, Dick. Let me let me ask you um, one thing that I've wondered about uh, with the rise of a couple of things in the current innovation space in care delivery: data, analytics, machine learning, AI all the technology and then the data that has to feed it. It seems like, at least today, the more fruitful place that you can apply that in healthcare for efficiencies is in sort of the wraparound supportive services around the care delivery itself. So you talked about online scheduling, or you talk about mathematical modeling for demands for infusion chairs. And there's a lot that can be done and we can learn from other industries. And the data is ready to be analyzed for that. Whereas the data in actual care delivery is a little more scattershot, you know, we'll definitely want to hear more from Louise about the, the pros and cons of that. But are you seeing that we're right for the machine learning and technology in the supportive pieces of the care delivery, or are we really ready for actual care delivery, using it to inform our care decisions? Yeah, so this is an absolutely great question, and we talked a little bit about it uh, last, last night as well. Um, you know, here we are in the digital age, uh, so a thought experiment is, are we going to have less digital technology in healthcare in 10 years or more? So I don't have a hard time with that, that question. Right. So next question is... Clearly what, less. Uh, it's, oh, going oh, oh. A lot less. it's going to be a lot less. Right. 50% chance of it. Uh, so, so now uh, let's ask another question. All right, so you're going to medical school. You're 24 years old and you're going to start in medical school. So you want to pick the medical school that will give you the most training in the use of digital technologies for patient uh, care. Which medical school would you pick? The answer is, there are none. There, as far as I know, and please grab me afterwards and correct me, but as far as I know, there is not a single medical school that offers a one semester course. Yes, you can get weekend courses. One semester course in the use of digital technology for improved patient care. That's ridiculous, right? So uh, e- even, if, even if it's two that are doing it, it's still ridiculous. So I would like to... Uh, I'm calling for uh, maybe the, the National Academy of Medicine, somebody to take the lead in doing a, a study that would be like the Flexner study, which I'll mention in a second. How many people know Flexner study? Okay. So uh, in, in 1909, uh, Abraham Flexner was the president of uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. And in 1909, to be qualified to be a doctor, you had to meet certain educational requirements. They were two years in high school. That's what you needed to be a doctor in 1909, right? And Flexner said, this is crazy. Uh, we've, we've got to up the standards. So he uh, got a grant from John D. Rockefeller 
and studied 50 universities and came up with basically the architecture of today's medical system. We haven't done that since 1909. I think every century you should kind of renew uh, <laughs> the, the, these things. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I would like to call for, and, and Olin would be a great place to start really getting some energy behind this thing, a real reassessment of what should medicine look like, given that we have digital technology now, a lot of it, and we're going to have a lot more. Yeah. So I'd like to see that, and, and then when we meet in 10 years to continue this discussion, yeah. we'll have a different answer. Absolutely. Uh, I, could I just add sure. that um, I'm optimistic about it, for sure. Um, you know, just looking at medical school curriculums and even residency curriculums, um, there's uh, been an influx of humanities, right, being incorporated mm -hmm. into the curriculum. So I think that's, that's almost like a little bit of a start, yeah. right? Like it being is. a little right. bit more progressive. Right. Um, as far as digital goes, um, so I'm still seeing patients um, with Emory residents uh, at Grady Hospital, which is a safety net hospital in Atlanta, in the outpatient clinic. And so I do workshops related to digital ah. health. Oh, there so, you, um, you know, ranging from uh, digital health primary care trends as, you know, consumer health information online, that type of thing, um, how to navigate and help your patients navigate what's available from Dr. Oz or Goop or whatever that may be out there, um, and, and how to have those type of conversations with your patients. So, and I will tell you this, that um, the feedback I get from residents is always extremely positive because it's so different um, than the other sort of uh, talks they have during their um, primary care rotation. Um, so, so I I'm think they're hungry for it. Your name and email to Victor Zhao and tell okay. him uh, who, who has the NAM and, and, and tell him that he's really got to talk to you and yeah. Please, I'll give yeah. you my card. Yeah, and I think, I think, I think you, the three of you have identified, I would say probably two significant gaps in medical education today. One is digital. You know, how do we use the tools, much like we get taught a lot how to use a stethoscope. Well, the understanding this digital ecosystem and the ways to use it is really important. But the other, and I've really been struck by this <clears throat> too, is how do, how do we effectively um, build those relationships with patients? which I would argue will become even more important for physicians in the digital age, ironically, maybe, because so much of the information that we needed to hold in our head scientifically, a lot of that's just gonna be available digitally. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the guidelines are gonna be built into our EHRs. Yep. Some of that stuff that we've had to memorize, we won't have to, fortunately, because we can use our brains now to think about what are the unique characteristics of that patient in front of us, and how do we best engage for their long-term health and well-being. Yeah. I would add one thing that I, I think is lacking is um, true teamwork. Mm, and teamwork isn't point. that I'm the boss, you listen to what I say, yep. um, but actually that we collaborate across the spectrum. And I think that uh, by design, uh, the current delivery model and training model is very physician hierarchical focused. Yep. You know, and especially I think it gets even worse or maybe worse is the wrong word, but more complicated when you look at interventional procedures and surgical procedures. Um, that model is not going to work. Um, in fact, I think there's again, it's part of the deprogramming um, for in population-based healthcare delivery or in telehealthcare-based de delivery. Um, you have to work across the spectrum, and one person can't do it all. And even if they could, there's this there's such an imbalance in supply and demand from for physicians and the need even in this country that that's not a that's not a scalable model anymore. So the ability to actually work with teams effectively and how you do that is not something. At least, look, I went to med school 25 years ago. Um, I have, was not taught it. In fact, I learned a lot more about how to manage probably these things at McKinsey than I ever did at, which even back then had structured learning around team and, we did, right. and things like that, which I don't know if it even exists today in med school. It may or by just Well, we, we, I mean, I would just say, just from the Emory yeah. perspective, you yeah. know, huddles and, and, and everyone having a voice. I think yeah. also models like ChenMed, yeah. um, IRA Health, CityBlock, really puts an emphasis on that yeah. collaborative team yeah. approach to care, yeah. which I think is super important, agree. Right. Totally agree. I do want to give our audience a chance to, to ask any questions they may have with panelists. Um, one thing you mentioned about teamwork, I've noticed here with the hospital, some have, they all, many have different systems. Epic, you know, you go to right. um, several doctors and it might be several different databases yep. and you don't know who sees what, so you bring in a gigantuan volume of information. But to me as a patient, it's been very confusing. I don't know how the doctor can handle that too. 
when maybe their hospital doesn't see another hospital's records on you? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, it's a pet, pet peeve of mine. Um, it's a shame, um, and I apologize on behalf of the system, uh, the healthcare system. Um, we're having this conversation right before this meeting, actually. The federal government has pumped in billions of dollars to enable healthcare uh, to enable healthcare vendors and IT, uh, uh, EMR electronic health record vendors to go into business. And Epic, you guys use Epic, Cerner, fill in the blank. Part of that, and this is what was called the High Tech Act about ten years ago, and literally it was a free for all, which enabled you know mass deployment of healthcare technology into hospital systems. That was not meant to cause a silo and create a competitive advantage. Um, it was actually meant to transfer, to your point, information between different doctors, between different hospitals, between patient and doctor. But what unfortunately has happened is this intersection of public policy and capitalism where, and I'm using Epic generically, you can fill in the blank with any EMR system. They are now using that to their advantage saying, hey, we will not open our door to communication because that makes us less valuable. It's true, right? It's commoditization of that business. Um, and for that reason, a lot of healthcare vendors, um, electronic health record vendors, have limited access, even frankly to patients to some extent, um, which is shameful. There's actually an act currently, I think this week being brought up, which of course all the major vendors are uh, fighting, is to actually have open access, um, which, is uh, just perplexing to me that how this business could actually have the gall to oppose that, given that the business was stood up mm -hmm. really by federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think patients like you or people like you should express your frustration to your uh, uh, legislators to get this thing done. Um, because it is, it's really, and even for providers like us who don't have a dog in the hunt, but really want access to patient data, it's a big challenge and it's really doing nobody any good. Um, it's really this sort of Microsoft Windows versus Apple versus other platform discussion, which never ends well for anybody. You need a unified platform, unless you're the company who owns the platform. Right. Then you make bank, but that wasn't the purpose of why the government funded this stuff, right? So, sorry, sorry. my soapbox. We had, a, we had a question in the back corner, if I saw the hand correctly, yep. I just wonder if there's any kind of push in medical school uh, admissions to uh, take a, the student who is not quite so nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with nerds? What's wrong with Come nerds? on. <laughs> Come on. And, and a little more uh, sensitive or patient-oriented? Um, I don't know if I, I mean, I would just say um, having encountered or been working with um, Emory uh, students and residents for a while, you know, there's an emphasis on diversity, right? Um, medical school is very competitive. Uh, you know, you get to a point where everyone has good grades and they have good MCAT scores and, you know, good letters of recommendation. So interviews become important, essays or um, other, other factors become important. And, and I believe, um, and again, N of one, um, that there is emphasis on looking at other attributes in, in people who are applying, um, which I think is a good thing, and, and making sure there's diversity in the classes. Yeah, I, also, I also think with that, um, <clears throat> I, I've been impressed by the fact that this can be taught. You know, you, you certainly you want to look for mm -hmm. people who have some intrinsic ability, but frankly, almost anybody can be taught this. There's, there's some basic principles. McKinsey does this, structured learning. A lot of customer service industries do this. Medicine just never thought about it. So I think part of the Flexner 2.0 that Dick is calling for should include that, and the update should include. But we have some classes, which I'll argue yeah, are a little the, the like humanities -ish. Lucy. I yeah. mean, we did one, John Stone, who now has passed, unfortunately, at Emory, would read poetry. Okay. But actually, I need some skills around how to interact with different people, yeah. particularly people different than me, in an effective way, because we know that long-term relationship, to Gareth's point, is gonna be really therapeutic. It's almost as important as the pill. So, um, but your call out is wonderful. I agree with it. One over here in the corner. Sure. Hi, Gaurav, John Rice here. Hi, oh, John. So, um, my group, uh, ESSA Health, has been doing what ChenMed has been doing for about 25 years. We do full risk uh, Medicare Advantage. And uh, my group is basically a bunch of internists and family practitioners that uh, work like ChenMed does. 
Now, I know you're coming to town in the summer. I think one of your biggest hurdles is going to be finding any independent physicians that are still left. Yeah. Uh, all the internists, uh, except for my group and a few others, are owned by the hospitals, and right. they're not available to you as you come to town. Yeah. So um, I think one of the bedrock principles of a successful uh, global risk program like yours and ours is that the physicians are compensated in a way that promotes this kind of keep the patient well instead of treat them when they're sick mentality. Yeah. It's, it's a totally different approach. So uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, um, first of all, um, SSA is awesome. So congrats to all the great work you've done um, at SSA. And we really view them as, view you guys as like folks who, un, who get it, right? Um, I think 25 years is a very long time to be in the same job. So why don't we talk afterwards and see what you want to do <laughs> this summer? Um, we, may have, we may have an option. Um, but uh, on a more serious note, um, you know, we're on this really, um, I'd say for us, Accelerate, we're opening 25 clinics in five cities, 22 clinics in five cities this summer. And we get asked the question a lot, like, and my, part of my job is to figure out the number and where. And I, there, I often get asked the question, why not 66? Why not 800? What, like, and, and it's actually your point. The rate limiting step to our growth is actually getting doctors who understand how to manage risk. They do not exist. They are not trained, even at great med schools like, you know, uh, WashU. They're not trained on how to manage end to end. It's big, and and I, you could again switch the name for any med school. It's really about the disease state, not the end to end continuum. Um, in a city like St. Louis, where we're entering, you're absolutely right. Um, we have just hired our first uh, physician from WashU um, as a resident. So, um, but uh, it, it is very challenging because there's not many independent practitioners left um, who would be a, probably the perfect fit for us because they, you know, they own their own, own business here. Their own, they'll own their own P and L, um, and it it becomes challenging. We we do it a few ways. One is we've had to reshape our thinking on um, tenure. So there was a bias, again, these are biases you have that sometimes are correct or not correct, that given our patient population, given how sick they are, that you need you know, a doc who's been practicing, we use it, they have to be in their mid-40s was kind of the thought. That they have to be in their mid-40s, they've seen enough um, that they know how to manage complexity, but they're not old enough that they're not gonna change their ways. Um, that's a flawed assumption. We, uh, more, out of, more out of necessity in Philadelphia when we opened two years ago, the whole crew is, right out of residency or maybe two to three years out, performing one of the best markets we've ever had. So one approach we're taking is to actually look at fresh grads, uh, brand new residents, um, which is new for us, or at least at this point is still relatively new. Um, and second is we actually get a lot of folks from healthcare systems who are very interested in joining us. Um, and look, I've been at healthcare systems, and frankly in a local one, the conversation, PCPs are not held by healthcare systems as a major area of focus, right? I mean, um, drive to, you know, uh, Central West End, there is no tower for primary care. Um, there is no tower for value-based medicine. There are a lot of towers for cardiology and neurosurgery and cancer and stuff. So I think what we provide is, hey, here's a platform where the PCP actually is the king or the queen of managing um, a very uh, uh, interesting uh, business and also manage, working very closely with patients. I think the other thing we offer is the ability to actually engage and practice them. One of our slogans is be the doctor you want it to be, right? Really working with patients and not having to do with, deal with a lot of the headaches that you were mentioning, right. Dick, um, of OBGYNs yeah. running a practice. Um, it's a slog, a lot of my time is spent uh, with too many, was it, who said the comment of bad chicken dinners? Um, uh, a lot of dinners, a lot of events. Uh, on the 21st of February, any PCP, please come to The View. We're having a recruiting event. <laughs> um, did I just plug it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, but I can't underestimate that that is by far our number one challenge. Good morning. I'm a, I'm a total fish out of water. I have nothing to do with the medical or pharmaceutical industry, I'm a, more of a patient than anything else. But a few minutes ago, uh, you were discussing telehealth. And I just want to say this, uh, I go through the VA for all of my medical treatment. I'm 100% happy with them. I'm diabetic, and uh, about a year ago, they offered me a telehealth program where I absolutely love it. It's a device every morning at 10 o'clock, 
it buzzes me and it says, good morning, it's time for your blood sugar. So I, within five minutes, I send them all my blood sugar, blood pressure information, and that's the end of it. But what impresses me is if there's a day where, let's say, my blood pressure is too high, I've had instances where the telephone will ring, 10 minutes later, say, Mr. Rhodes, this is Don at the VA, why was your blood pressure high this morning? So my point is, uh, it's almost as though you're having a nurse practitioner right there in the house reminding you to do things right. that normally you would overlook. So, but uh, my thing, if you're on a tell, getting the information back to that patient and letting them know that there is something favorable or worrisome that morning so that you're not just saying, I'm submitting information and it's getting lost in the cloud somewhere. Absolutely, I think that's, you really hit the nail on the head with that. Um, with Babylon, we're, we're talking now about integrate, you know, our integrated health model and what that will look like, and it's exactly what you're describing. Having that closed loop where, you, where the patient and the providers are getting feedback to each other and from each other um, is, is really uh, critical to that um, being a su success. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you love your telehealth experience and that you're getting that feedback. That's absolutely the, the direction we're moving in for sure. That's what we're That's focused on. So in the past two, three decades, we've seen a lot of consolidation throughout the healthcare industry where Hospitals are merging, companies, pharma companies, PBMs, insurance have all been sort of gathering and you have fewer and fewer players and costs have been going up. In the last 24 hours, two of the biggest pharma companies have announced they're going to split. And so this fragmentation idea is actually starting to gain hold where maybe there are greater efficiencies by specialization and other things. Do you anticipate that might occur here where these consolidated empires start to fragment and do either to technology improvements or to greater efficiency gains. Is that in the future or do you anticipate that this consolidation trend is going to continue? I'll take one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, this is another area of passion of mine, so I'll excuse myself up front. Um, consolidation has not yielded benefits for patients. Um, and this is not my opinion. These are studies that have shown in every city where there's been a significant consolidation, prices have gone up. And again, fill in the blank with healthcare system. It is ultimately about contract leverage. Um, in a, because that's the business. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, when BJC buys a hospital, a sat, quote unquote satellite hospital, that's a rational economic choice to make because the thought is that over time those patients for complex cardiac care will drive to big barns and we'll make money there and if we make, we lose money and fill in the blank town. Um, and I've personally done those deals when I was at a, a, with two healthcare systems in the past. Um, that hasn't worked out well for patients though and it hasn't worked out well for the country um, from a cost perspective. I also think that when you look at novel care delivery, since there's been a double downing on free for service, it actually goes to Dick's uh, book around creative destruction. We view we view everything from the context of a hospital system. But Babylon doesn't even think about the hospital system. Frankly, we don't care about the hospital system in a, in a good way. Like, yeah, we're going to St. Louis, we'll, we're gonna open clinics, Babylon's gonna launch is in NHS, not worrying about what the hospital network is. But I think because the predominant uh, finance model in this country is fee-for-service, everything is viewed in the context of that. So when we view uh, population-based health care services, we just assume that's going to stem from some hospital health care system entity. But that isn't the, tr the truth. So I think what's going to happen over time, it, and, and frankly, it's very difficult, and I don't want to speak for Dick, but I keep quoting your book, but um, you can't keep build... It's you, fun, it's you, fun. You, correct, me, <laughs> correct me when I'm wrong. You can't build the new company out of the existing company, especially when there's too many incentives to keep mm. funding the beast, right? Um, and I think because of that, you're seeing an explosion on the value. The va if, you know, I was recently at, a J at the uh, J.P. Morgan's healthcare conference. All the talk is, is about funding, you can either look at VC, PE, whatever. 
into delivery models that actually disintermediate the hospital yep. system. It doesn't yep. mean the hospital doesn't have a role. The hospital Absolutely. has a tremendous role in complex care. Hey, if I get hit by a truck, um, or maybe shot after this meeting, which is a possibility. Um, I want to go, I, I need a hospital, I need a hospital to take care of me, right? Or if I have a heart attack, I need a hospital to take care of me. But I don't need a hospital to do primary care mm -hmm. and care continuum outside of the hospital. That could be any entity. It could be a virtual entity. It could be a bricks and mortar entity. It could be an AI bot. I don't know. Um, and I think that so uh, the long answer to your question is I think that the future is a bifurcated one. And I think also for healthcare systems to survive, five years, seven years, ten, I know it's been value-based care has been coming for the past 10 years, but we really are getting to an inflection point where the leadership of these entities have to be viewing cost of care as a business, not as a nuisance. Because that is where the country is going, and it's just the law of big numbers. I can't remember who said there's 10,000 seniors uh, coming into uh, Medicare every day. It's the number one item in this country's federal budget after defense, which is growing at a cost of, uh, at an inflation rate faster than, the, uh, uh, sorry, at a CAGR faster than inflation. It's not sustainable, and that's why the average American family is spending $20,000 on healthcare. What, what people are forgetting is that that's $20,000 of their money that they're throwing away, or at least part of it. And that, I think, those numbers are going, are coming to a point where they're not sustainable, and to, to manage costs, you're going to after either have to completely alter your business model, or bisect it, or divest it, and maybe that's what you're, I don't know what these uh, pharma deals you're mentioning, but that's my belief. Um, we'll see what happens. Are we, are we have time for one more question? Okay, one more. So I wanted to comment on uh, Dick's challenge to to the industry of having a digital technology class. I think that's extremely important. Uh, as a disclaimer, I will tell you, I'm on the contracting side for medical devices, and, and that was one reason why I wanted to come in and, and listen to J&J &J talk, too, is that a company, and J&J is a highly respected healthcare and marketing company. I, 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 do, I think they're wonderful. Um, the one piece of challenge when you think about value-based care is to Dick's challenge of having a digital technology type of classes, being careful that companies such as J&J, Medtronic, Boston, Abbott, are not the ones funding those type of classes because the challenge is that yeah. then your PCP or your <laughs> cardiologist, that is what they're trained on. That's all they know. They, I can't do anything with anything else. And so when you talk about cost, there are other players that have something that is just as clinically acceptable at a lower cost <clears throat> that is going to be more valuable to a hospital system in order for them to still be profitable in what they need to do and still be innovative at the same time. Because I think at some times you may have just the some of these small conglomerate companies really driving the industry and there's, they're kind of stopping innovation that helps with value-based care. So I don't know if you can comment on that. And, the, and the, my second question too is, uh, there was a recent um, story, I think it was on 60 Minutes, how NYU is offering free, care, uh, free tuition to medical students. Do you see that as something that maybe there's a, that could become a trend and how that can help with value-based care? Yeah, so let me let me comment on, on the first uh, the, the first one. Uh, uh, when I was at McKinsey for the 31 years I was there, for 25 of those I served J and J, um, I, and I didn't uh, work with Alex because he wasn't there at the time. But I did work with two of his three predecessors, uh, so I know the company very well. And I, uh, in fact, I was Ralph Larson was the chairman before the chairman before Alex, and he and I worked together. Uh, to set up a company called Ethicon Endosurgery. So uh, uh, I've actually been in that business for quite a long time. Um, you've seen that J&J's just bought Oris. J&J uh, would love to train all the surgeons in the United States. Uh, why, why not? What's wrong with that idea, right? Uh, and, and so would Medtronic on, on the, uh, you know, in, their, in their lines. So I think it is an important uh, issue. And the only way that's going to happen is if we have alternative training uh, that that uh, you know can fill can fill the gaps, and these are getting. Uh, I was just thinking about it with regard to surgery. Uh, there's there's no reason uh, a surgeon uh, can't monitor their mental state during surgery right now, but it's not done. 
Uh, and we know a lot about that. We, we know what to monitor. We, we know how it affects the, successful, the success rate of surgeries, speed of surgery, all that kind of, and we're not doing it. So, yeah, so I, I think there's a lot in what you say, and, and we ought to do this. The med ed thing is, is a very big, uh, uh, big issue. So uh, l let me just leave it at that one because I think we're getting sh uh, short on time. But it's a great question, I think. We need, to do more, we need to be asking more of these kinds of questions. We need to bring the digital technology into healthcare as a normal part of healthcare. Well, this, this really has been a great conversation. I greatly appreciate the ringside seat and all the, the insights that the three of you have provided. Uh, and I appreciate you all taking the time. Please join me in thanking them for that. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'd also like to thank Tom and the uh, distinguished panel for really uh, great insights and, and uh, for a great event today. Um, and I'd like to again thank all those who make, helped make this possible, particularly uh, Mark Reefsteck, who I think uh, helped us hatch this idea a couple of years ago. And so I hope you agree it's been a, a great success. Um, please mark your calendars for another healthcare-focused event coming up shortly at, uh, at Olin. Uh, you probably know we have a very strong uh, relationship with the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., the world's premier think, uh, well, economic and social policy think tank, um, where we've expanded our, our footprint, our relationship there. But part of that relationship is to bring Brookings here as well. So, in fact, um, on April 2nd, we have a joint uh, WashU Olin uh, Brookings uh, event, um, and the title is Healthcare and the 2020 Election. Why are Americans paying so much? Um, and uh, it'll be here on April 2nd uh, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So please mark your calendars for that and look out for our announcements. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.